Welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge. I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, the Social Capital Research Group is a, a collective, of, an international collective of researchers. I think we've got uh, about a thousand members on the Facebook group currently, um, and we're based around uh, the website as well, socialcapitalresearch.com, uh, that contains a lot of resources, and, and we post links to events such as this on, on the website. Um, it's really my great pleasure to introduce our invited speaker for this session. Uh, Rick Uslana is the Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland, College Park, and he is the author of 11 books, uh, including one that I'm sure everyone who's doing research on social capital is familiar with. Uh, the title is on the screen, The Moral Foundations of Trust. It's my very great pleasure to, to welcome Rick. Um, over to you if you'd like to, to give us your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Tristan, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm going to give a talk, and I'm happy to have people interrupt with questions either during the talk or after it. Uh, and I'll talk for probably about a half an hour or so. And I'm going to start with a story as to how I first got interested in trust. For the beginning of my career, I was primarily working on American politics especially the U.S. Congress, and that was what got me into this business to begin with. And back in the early 1990s, I was one of the first people to notice that there was a tremendous increase in the level of polarization and intensity in the Congress. And I published a book in 1993 called The Decline of Comedy in Congress, Why There Was So Much Nastiness. And some people had said that the rise of nastiness was related to some institutional changes. Well, for all of my career, I have been arguing against institutional accounts. And I really believe that what was happening in the Congress reflects what was happening in the country. So I was looking for an explanation as to why Congress had become so polarized. And since I believe that the level of polarization in society was key, I looked for something in society. And what I found, which made sense to me, was the level of social trust. And I presented some very preliminary evidence that as the level of social trust declined in the United States over time, the level of polarization in the Congress increased. It became more and more difficult to get legislation passed. It became more and more difficult to find unity between the parties and more and more difficult to get some procedural rules enacted between the parties in Congress. And this led me to argue that the reason why there was a decline of comedy in Congress is that there was a decline in social trust in the country. And this led to a rather surprising invitation that turned out to be the start of a very big change in my career and sort of a running conflict with the leading progenitor of what is called social capital, and that's Bob Putnam. Putnam argued that it was basically trust that shaped many other things. And what I began to argue is that trust is something unique and of itself. And it really did not fall into the same component as most other aspects of what he called social capital. And that's what I'm going to start off with today. So today, here's what I'm going to talk about. One, what is my conception of trust? How does it differ from most other people's conceptions of trust? As reflected in my book, The Moral Foundations of Trust. How do we measure trust? What does trust reflect? 
what does trust not reflect? What causes trust? And what does trust affect? Then I move to a second book on trust, which is also a controversy with Putnam. Putnam wrote a very famous article called E Pluribus Unum that appeared in Scandinavian Political Studies, in which he argued that as society became more diverse, people became less trusting. And my second book on trust, Segregation and Mistrust, argues that it's not diversity that leads to less trust, it is segregation, and the two are not the same. So this was my second bone of contention with Putnam. Then I will ultimately move to my new book, which I hope to hear very shortly, within a week or so, that will be accepted by Oxford University Press on national identity and political polarization, which talks about something that is happening the world over. And what is happening in the world over is an increase of a sense of inclusive or to be exclusive national identity that you actually have to share some demographic traits with other people to be accepted as belonging to a society and deserving of its benefits. So let me back up and start at the moral foundations of trust. And if you want to go to the beginning of the uh, slides, you will see my conception of trust. There are three sorts of types of trust that I talk about. Overall, what makes my work distinctive is the notion of moralistic trust. And before I had this idea, only one other person actually did, which was who was Jane Mansbridge, who is now at Harvard. Moralistic trust or generalized trust, they're basically the same thing, is trust in strangers. They are trust in people you don't know. So now you see here generalized trust, uh, okay, is trust in strangers. And I begin with a story. You'll probably all be happy to know that I trust my wife. I presume that most of you trust your spouses, your partners, other people you are close to. Now, that's very nice, but it doesn't make us trust people who are different from ourselves. And this is where I first began to disagree with people like Russell Harden and with Putnam. Putnam argues that if we trust people who are like ourselves, it will extend to people who are different from ourselves. And my argument is that's simply not true. So if I trust my wife, that is not going to let me trust strangers. One group I like to be talk about is Martians. Now, I presume that no one here knows any Martians. But in order to be able to trust someone, say a Martian, that we've never met, we can't rely upon experience. So how do we develop this sense of trust? And my argument is we develop this sense of trust early in life. We learn it from our parents who teach us a trusting attitude. It stays stable throughout our course of life, and it does not depend upon experience. The type of trust that does depend upon experience is what do I call over here strategic trust. That's trust we gain from daily experience. So you might trust me to your talk, but you shouldn't trust me to paint your house. You shouldn't trust me to perform brain surgery on you. And that is that will vary from day to day. So if you loan me five dollars and I don't pay you back, then you won't trust me tomorrow. But that shouldn't affect your views of the rest of the world. In fact, if someone came and punched you in the mouth right now, that should not affect your view of the whole rest of the world. 
it should affect your view of that particular person. So strategic trust and generalized trust have very different bases. Then there's also particularized trust. Particularized trust, this is a term that was invented by Toshio Yamagishi in Japan, and it is trust in people very much like yourself, people of the same background. And Putnam again argues, if you trust people like yourself, then you should trust people who are different. But actually, there may not be a positive relationship. In fact, the more you trust people just like yourself, it may very well be that the less you trust people who are different from yourself. If you only believe that person, people who look like you, who think like you, who have your religious background, who come from the same countries, in that case, you will have less generalized trust. And let me just go on and give a couple more examples before I move on. On the notion of generalized trust, let's see where it comes here. Um, Oh, let's see. It's, well, I just talk about it here. How we measure trust. There are questions that were invented in the 1940s by Morris Rosenberg, who was then at Cornell. And Rosenberg came up with three questions that he called a trust scale. The standard trust question that I like is, generally speaking, do you believe most, there you go, so go back to that one. Yeah. Do you believe that most people can be trusted or can't you be too careful? Or no? Okay, don't worry about it. There you go, stay there. And most people can be trusted. Now, what I did is I had access to what was called a think aloud experiment that was part of an experiment in the 2016 American National Election Studies pilot, in which they actually asked people, what do you mean when you hear these questions? And if you look at this, you see 72% of people gave general responses to the question, most people can be trusted, that is, they were thinking about good people in general. They were thinking about people who were nice and who were, uh, and who, that they feel they could put confidence in, who share their moral community. Fairness is much easier. When someone is fair, that means that they wouldn't cheat you. And only 56% said, gave general answers, whereas 44% based it upon experience. Finally, the third measure of helpfulness is even less dependent upon general thought and more on experience. 61% said experience. So that means if you're walking down a street and you ask someone, how do I get from here to there? They'll tell you. So these three components are not the same. At the individual level, they are only modestly correlated. Two other points before I move on. There is a question that people, some people have used about whether you would find, what you would do if you find a wallet. <coughs> Sorry. And this is done primarily by some researchers in Canada. John Hellowell, in particular, at the University of British Columbia. And they asked people in a question first formulated by Steve Knack at the World Bank, suppose you found a wallet in the street. Would you return it to its owner? Would you return it to the police? Would you return it to uh, a, a, a stranger? And would it depend upon how much money was in the wallet? Would you keep the money? No, there's no data on this on, the, on here. So I'll just give you some numbers. Turns out that most people, about half of the people, would return the wallet in general. 
the more money in the wallet, the less likely it is that people would return the wallet. The more money in the wallet, the less likely it is that they will return it to a stranger. Now, that's interesting, but it's basically what I call strategic trust. It's something that happens very infrequently. It doesn't require a moral judgment that much. And I don't think it is a really good measure of whether or not you can put faith in other people. Finally, what Putnam uses in bowling alone is another measure that comes from a lifestyle survey, survey saying most people are honest. Well, honesty is not the same as trust. And when the lifestyle survey asked people, are most people honest? 86% said most people are honest. That's a pretty low barrier to be honest compared to about 40% who say that most people can be trusted. So here's where I'm coming from. Trust is something that is distinctive. It is not related to honesty, it's not related to fairness, it is not related to helpfulness. Nor is it related, and here's where we start to get to the slides, if you can get to them uh, from the book. Two friends of mine in Denmark, Christian Bjornskov and Kim Sanderskov, wrote a paper that was published in Political Behavior and they ask the following question, and this forms the basis of some of my critique of Putnam. Is trust a part of social capital? And their argument and my argument is no. Most of what Putnam talks about on social capital is completely unrelated to trust. And if anyone has a copy of it, you can see on table four, they come up with a whole series of measures of social capital. First, social trust. And do people here understand statistics? Is Tristan, Tristan, can I talk about statistics for a moment? Yeah, sure thing, absolutely. Okay, so do people have an understanding of something called factor analysis, which you take a whole bunch of activities and see if they're correlated with each other. And if they are, you'll get one factor, one dimension, one notion of social capital. And that's what Putnam believes. If they're not, you'll get multiple dimensions. So when Bjornskov and Sanderskov looked at some of these measures, they found that there were one. First, there were five distinct dimensions that were basically uncorrelated with each other. First was trust. Second was belonging to groups, cultural associations, sports clubs, and youth organizations. They all correlated with each other. Third was government agencies. The, there we go. You see here the police, parliament, and the government in general. Then there were individual associations, political associations labor unions, political parties, human rights organizations, and local political organizations. And then there's honesty, claiming benefits from the government, accepting bribes, and avoiding fares, and cheating on taxes. So here you have one, two, three, four, five separate dimensions of what Putnam calls social capital, and they're basically uncorrelated. And let me just give a quick story on the difference between government and social trust. When 
you learn trust. You learn it from your parents at an early age. It sticks with you throughout most of your life. Confidence in the government depends upon who's in power. And when your favored political party is in power, you're going to have a lot more confidence than when it's not in power. So confidence in government, trust in government, changes depending upon who's in power and how well they're performing on the economy, on foreign policy, on many policy issues. So right now, I can sort of give you a little biography. I'm much more confident in the government than I was last year. But my overall level of social trust shouldn't be affected by whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden is president. Nor should my ability to join organizations be affected. And when you go join organizations, what Ken Newton of uh, Britain has said, you don't spend a whole lot of time in them and you aren't going to be able to develop much trust. Let's go to the next uh, slide, slide two, table two, we can get there. And here you have some sort of social activities. Family activities, when camping, family breakfast. And this is what actually turned me against Putnam. I heard him give a talk at the World Bank saying we go on fewer picnics than we used to. And I was wondering, how would that affect my view of people who look different from myself? I've never invited anybody I didn't know to a picnic. I've never had them over for dinner. Then other things are including on this list, going bowling. Well, when you go bowling, you generally go bowling with people you know. And the fact that you may be bowling alone shouldn't affect your attitudes towards people who are different from yourself. What does seem to affect trust is not joining a group, not going bowling, not going on a picnic, not joining a choral society, but two types of activities that I talk about in my book. One is volunteering, and secondly, giving to charity. But even there, you have a different set of outcomes. If I give to a charity of my own faith, when I volunteered at my son's school when he was in school, that was parenting. That was being part of a faith group. What counts as a component of trust is volunteering for a group that helps people who are different from yourself, giving to a charity that may help people in a different part of the world who may be in trouble. So let me move on from there and talk about some of the bases of trust and then go on to segregation and identity fairly quickly. The fundamental basis of trust is optimism for the future. It's the belief that the world is a good place, it's going to get better, and you don't have to risk anything by trusting people who may be different from yourself. And in turn, optimism rests upon a foundation, not of institutions, but of economic equality. The more equal society is, the, large, the smaller the gap between the rich and the poor, the more you would believe that there is a fundamental unity in membership in a society. And when that occurs, you are willing to consider all the members of society as equal to yourself, you are willing to give them benefits in what the Nordics call universalistic social welfare policies. The more you believe that there is a gap between the rich and the poor, and that only certain people should be given benefits, the more you believe in sort of an exclusivist worldview where benefits should be means tested and should be dependent upon how hard people are willing to work to derive these benefits. So my overall argument is that trust 
depends upon equality. And you will find that the countries in the world that have the greatest equality, the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, Tristan, your country, Australia, have the highest levels of trust. What makes the United States stand out is among Western democracies, it has among the lowest levels of trust because it has among the highest levels of inequality. And countries that are poor generally have higher levels of inequality and they have less trust. So inequality leads to less trust. One or two other things on this. Trust and inequality are both what economists would call sticky. They don't change much over time. So that when you measure trust over time, it doesn't change that much from one country to another. When countries become democratic, as happened in much of the transition world, in other countries that were former colonies, they don't necessarily become more trusted because they don't become more equal. So democracy does not lead to more trust. Countries that become more equal become more trusting, but there aren't that many countries that do become that much more equal. And as a result, both equality and trust are sticky over time. They don't change much over time. And countries that were equal a long time ago are still the most trusting now. And it's a very simple story about why, which comes first. I've co-authored stuff with Bu Rusty of Gothenburg University in Sweden. And he's more of an institutionalist. He believes that good institutions create trust. And I say that equality creates good institutions and therefore equality creates trust. And one simple story on that, I was giving a talk in Uppsala some years ago and I was given a tour of the museum at Uppsala. And the director of the museum showed me a portrait of the king and his court in the 13th century. So who would you expect to see in the king's court in the 13th century? Well, just as you would expect, there was the clergy and there was the landed gentry, but there were also peasants, which told me in the 13th century, the king's court in Sweden included people of lesser status. So there was a degree of equality in Sweden going all the way back to the 13th century. And that forms the basis of my argument that equality is fundamentally the core driver of trust. Let me briefly comment on two other things where I have I've moved since then. You remember I may have said that 2008 Putnam wrote this paper, which later on became sort of very, very famous, saying that as diversity increased in countries, as more people from different countries came to live in the United States and other particularly Western countries, you had less trust because people find it difficult to trust people who are different from themselves. That struck me as wrong because what tr generalized trust is all about is treating people who are the same, who, no, who are different from yourself. And let me see if I can find this slide here. If we can go back to um, uh, the uh, PowerPoint. And there's a graph with, a, with some dots on it. And if I can't find it, we'll just talk about it. Why don't I just talk about it? What's diversity? 
Diversity is having a society made up of people who look different from yourself. That doesn't tell you where people live. And you can have people who look different from yourself, but if they don't live near you, you will never have any contact with them. There will be no way you can develop good relations with them, and you will not fill Gordon Alpert's requirement that you have frequent interactions with them. So if the only people who don't look like me are people, say, who work in my office, who clean my office, or who clean my house, that's not going to make me trusting the people who are different from myself. What you need to have is more frequent interactions. And the only way you're going to get that is if you actually live next to people who are similar to yourself. And what I show in my book, Segregation and Mistrust, is that people who don't trust other people who look different from themselves, who think different from themselves, who are of different backgrounds. They don't want to move into areas populated by people who look different. And if you live in areas where, which are more diverse, and I'm very fortunate, and I do live in a very, very diverse area with people from every conceivable background. We have people from every religion. We have people from every ethnicity who share their culture, who share their food with us. It's sort of Donald Trump's worst nightmare in Montgomery County, Maryland. And it's his worst nightmare in another reason as well. The number of people from his political persuasion on our county council is zero. We are probably among the most left-wing people in the United States and the most diverse. Where you have a lot of segregation, whether it's all black, all white, all Jewish, all Muslim, all Catholic, all Asian, or Latino, those segregated areas have fewer people who trust people of different backgrounds. Where you have more diverse areas, you have more people who are trusting of other people. And then let me get on very quickly to, because I'm going to probably want to wrap this up soon, my new book, which is on national identity. And what national identity is, is a sense of who you are, who other people are, who is deserving, and who is not deserving. This isn't in the slides. This is something that's new, and that's hopefully will be in print very shortly. Uh, the idea of national identity again, is a two, twofold. It's a sense of belonging and a sense of deserving. Who belongs to a society? If you believe that to be a true American, a true Australian, a true Pole, that you must be white, that you must be of European ancestry, that you must be Christian, then you are much less likely to want to say that other people who are like you should belong to the society and deserve government benefits. In particular, in many countries, including the United States and Britain and France now, more people are willing to say that benefits should be resolved, reserved for people who look like themselves. And this is particularly true in many of the former communist countries who want to exclude people who don't look like them. And this has led to a lot of political polarization. In the United States and Britain, this has led to polarization across a variety of issues. So if you believe that the only people who are belong to a society should get benefits from that society, then you are going to be conservative on a whole wide range of issues, both nationalistic, cultural, and economic. Many of the people in the former communist countries believe that you can be able to give people benefits, but only people who look like you. And I'll mention 
two other countries that are part of my survey, a study that looks sort of very interesting, Israel and Taiwan. And the reason why these countries sort of stick out is that socioeconomic and cultural issues have now sort of faded from the political universe in those countries. The only things that really matter is background. So in Israel, Bibi Netanyahu has proposed legislation that gives priority for citizenship and benefits to Jews and excludes even Druze who serve in the army. In Taiwan, even people whose families came from China now identify as Taiwanese rather than Chinese and want to exclude people who consider themselves Chinese from the sort of national conversation. And when you have a politics based entirely on nationalism, this can lead to a tremendous level of conflict in society. And I've talked long enough, I'm willing to take some questions now. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to develop everything, but I thought I probably covered a lot of ground. Yeah, thanks very much, Rick. I think you certainly have covered a lot of ground there, and there's a lot of a lot of the things you say. I think are incredibly relevant to the audience. So, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to uh, raise your hand, perhaps, or you've got a relatively small group, so you could um, perhaps unmute yourself if you have any questions. Uh, you can also type in the chat if you like, and I'd be happy to to read out your question. Somebody's typing. Hi. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Okay. I have a question about the table you presented with the factor models. Yeah. Because because I think that was a uh, an EFA, an exploratory factor models, and I've seen that in these measures of social capital or trust. But actually, that researchers use EFA. Uh, my question is, why don't switch to confirmatory factor analysis? That is like uh, uh, an extension on EFA and is mathematically and statistically more solid. Is there any particular reason? I didn't reason? do the work. I'm just citing some work that some friends have done. And so I can't talk about why they did what they did. But let me tell you why I think it's important. Because a lot of these activities really don't relate to trust at all. So if I have a picnic, if I join a singing group, if I go bowling, I'm not sure why that should lead me to trust other people who are different from myself, or why that should lead me to trust government. In fact, I think that if I belong to a political party, that might, particularly in today's world, not only in the United States, but many other countries, lead me to be less trusting of people who support the other members of the other party. Right now, the level of polarization, at least in the United States, to a considerable extent in Britain, in France, in Austria, People who trust members of one party really fundamentally distrust members of the other party. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat um, about whether you'd be willing to have your slides shared with uh, sure. the members. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can send that out to everyone who's registered then uh, after the after the webinar. There's another question there from Jose as well uh, about whether trust defines equality levels uh, or equality defines trust levels. Two things. They are mutually reinforcing. But I believe ultimately equality comes first. And Putnam has challenged me on this. But the problem that he has is he was forced to look at equality when the General Social Survey first asked about equality in 1972. The American National Election Study asked 
the trust question as far back as 1960. And when you look at equality prior to 1960, it tracks trust better than trust reducing equality. But still there is a reciprocal relationship in the sense that the most equal countries like Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway, tend to have social policies that are universalistic. That is, give everyone benefits. They don't exclude people of different backgrounds. And universalistic policies produce more equality because everyone gets to benefit from those policies. Uh, there's a question there. I think Telly, you've raised your hand. Telly, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Tristan. Uh, yes, uh, firstly, um, I I totally agree with you uh, uh, regarding your thesis, um, and um, I'm on your side in terms of disputes with Putnam. Um, I was at the uh, session last week. I, f I feel that uh, the problem I have with uh, Putnam is his work is rather amnesic in terms of um, uh, it has a historical, hasn't taken account of uh, you know, the history of uh, America in terms of history of slavery and the genocide of the indigenous people. Um, so I feel that it's only recently he started to take account of uh, uh, equality, particular, particular racism, uh, which in a way I felt that he admit, admitted to that. Um, yes, so I, I yes, I, 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 on the whole, I agree with your central thesis regarding diversity, equality, uh, and um, uh, issues to do with trust. And somebody was posing the question that I saw sort of in a quote on the uh, screen. How do you get equality? Well, that's politics. And that's when people have to fight for it. Uh, so the fight for equality is not necessarily um, Somebody is, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Somebody has to fight for equality, and that not, is not necessarily a trust building process in and itself. Is it possible to build trust in unequal societies? I don't see how. Why would someone in an unequal society trust people who are different from themselves, who are richer, who are in, that they may see as oppressing them? I think first you have to establish some political force that will promote greater equality. And as the other gentleman just said, you know, most countries have histories that don't have a great deal of equality in them. And particularly countries that have had slavery or you now one of the reasons, you know, I have another book out dealing with a different topic called the historical roots of corruption. Why countries are more corrupt than others. And the answer to that again is not that they're democratic. You can have a democratic country that's very corrupt. My friend from Turkey here, democracy, highly corrupt. Brazil, democracy, highly corrupt. What creates a lack of corruption? The argument in my book, The Historical Roots of Cor Corruption, is universal education, which itself depends upon equality. So countries which were more equal back in the 1870s had higher levels of education. And this may come as a shock to some people, the strongest predictor of corruption today, 
certain countries is their mean level of education in 1870. Not their mean level of education today, but their mean level of education in 1870. And what that also shows is that countries that had places that were colonies back in the 19th and early 20th century have a lot to catch up to do because the colonial powers never invested much money in education for the local people. And that's why they remain corrupt and unequal today. Sorry, does someone else have a question here? Uh, there are a few questions coming through on the chat. Um, Tiara had a couple of questions. I think you've partially answered already about how communities have formed um, if equality is, is required for trust. Um, I think there's a follow-up question. So, so from her, so uh, communities must have formed without trust through coercion is the question. I'm waiting. I think I'm not sure she's going to unmute herself. Um, she's put the question in the chat. I don't know if you had any thoughts about how communities form without trust. Well, the only way communities form without trust is someone establishes a community geographically. That doesn't mean that people will like each other. It just means that they have to live together one way or another. They may live together by being bossed or they may live together in isolation. And let me just give you one other argument here. One of the proposed solutions to these problems is called multiculturalism. Canada has adopted this. So the English and the French don't get along very well. And the idea is, well, let everyone have their own culture. Quebec can have its own French culture. The Anglophone provinces can have their own culture. But the problem with multiculturalism is it produces segregation. People just live their own lives and they don't interact with each other. That does not present a sense of national unity. Yes, people can live together, but it doesn't create a sense of trust. But just to confirm then your views of the early societies were societies that were um, more based on necessity and, and did not have any trust. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And ultimately, in a modern world, that doesn't work too well. I mean, look what's going on right now in the United Kingdom. The place is falling apart. And I know a little bit about the place because my wife's English. And we're both willing to bet that within 20 years, there will not be a United Kingdom. That Scotland will withdraw. God knows what Wales will do. And I'm really worried about the long-term future of the United States. Sure, it will. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't see it splitting up. But when I look at where I live and compare it to Alabama, Nebraska, South Dakota, I don't see a whole lot in common. Kind of a different question then. It, do you see then that trust is a higher order concept to equality? And if that's the case, then if you were to go across, say, you know, animal species that don't necessarily always have a concept of equality, then do animals not have trust? No, I don't think that animals are capable of trust. Because in order to be capable of trust, you actually have to sort of view the world in terms that you consider people part of what I call your moral community. And what that means is that you have something in common with them. And somehow, I don't always see, I mean, 
some animals may decide that it's important for them to live together. But that's probably more of an issue of survival than it is of sort of real true cooperation. I think we've got another question from Steve, if you'd like to unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, good morning. morning. Uh, do, do you have or do you recommend a reliable, as in internally reliable, not necessarily compared to absolute terms, uh, a reliable longitudinal measure of changes in trust by uh, countries or large groups of communities, uh, something that could uh, put uh, changes in, in perspective across different countries? Well, the only cross-national longitudinal surveys which have to be taken with a grain of salt are the world value surveys. Why do I say they have to be taken with a grain of salt? They're a whole lot better in some countries than other countries because there is no national monitoring of individual countries. And some countries have far better levels of survey research than others. And I'll give you an example that may shock you. You know one of the worst countries? Canada. Now that should shock you because Canada is an advanced industrial country. When I study, and I've written some papers on Canada, and the world value surveys estimates for Canada differ dramatically from the estimates that you get from surveys done by very good people in Canada. So Canada, when you have really good survey people, at the University of British Columbia and the other Canadian National Election Studies is one of the most trusted countries in the world. The World Value Surveys show Canada as a relatively low trusted country. So you have to be very careful. As are, to, the, uh, are the longitudinal trends uh, uh, reliable though? In other words, can you say regardless of, of whether it's a good survey or not for that country, showing that uh, the changes over time in any of those countries are are valid from the World Value Survey, or are there other ones that would be better for specific countries? The only surveys that I would consider to be completely reliable, you're going to laugh at this, are the American surveys. Particularly? Particularly two, the American National Election Surveys and the, World, and the uh, General Social Survey, which is probably the, uh, the, those two are the gold standards. Thank you. They are probably the, the best surveys in the world. In fact, do you know the European Social Survey, which is now being developed? You're beginning to get a history there. It was based upon the General Social Survey in the United States. And was worked- Thank you very much. I'm mindful we're running short on time, Rick. Uh, there's one more question in the in the chat from Jose, who asks about what actions can be considered in in equal uh, countries to increase trust levels, so um, to develop their economies. So, uh, Jose is from Mexico. Okay. Well, what you need is more political movements that will support organizations, political parties labor unions or whatever that will drive to create more inequality more equality i'm sorry <laughs> more equality and the problem is you may need to decrease trust to begin with in order to get more trust eventually because what you need to do is to increase equality first trust is not going to occur without greater equality And so what, what might happen that might decrease that trust initially um, by, by what, social security or something, you know, political movements that might it's actually disadvantage some people? Designed to create 
more universalistic social welfare policies. Right. And so that would decrease trust initially, potentially, because yeah. some people would be worse off under that system. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that would be a very relevant question for other countries too. I know I have um, friends in Brazil who talk a lot about inequality um, within yeah. the country and, and the challenges of you know, what the government potentially could do to resolve those kinds of issues. And any place that used to be a colony that was exploited? Yeah. So there's one, I don't know if we've got time, uh, there's one final question about the relationship between poverty and social capital. We've got just one one moment. Okay. Some people have argued that it's income that leads to uh, more inequality. What I say is not so much income as it is to inequality. Now, poverty and inequality tend to be correlated, but they are not perfectly correlated. And inequality is a much stronger prediction over, predictor overall than absolute poverty is. Because you can have rich countries that are unequal. And you can have some poor countries where everyone's poor and they don't have that much inequality. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm mindful that we've, we've run out of time, Rick. Um, we, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And I think we're, we could have kept talking about these issues for a very long time. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of interest for exploring this in more detail. Well, people um, can but, send me emails. You have my email, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I certainly do. Um, and people can readily find your email on your university profile if you simply search for, for Rick Wilson. And I'm also have to do this again several times in the next two week or so to Poland. So uh, thank right. you for the opportunity to try this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll, let, I'll this... let you know when I hear from, from Oxford, because right now what's happened is it's been approved by the board. It has to be approved by the delegate. There's a delegate who will not meet for another 10 days, but I've been sort of given an assurance that the delegate rarely overrides the editor. So I'll have another yeah. book coming out. Yeah, we're certainly interested to follow that that development as well. Uh, so we'll we'll let you go, Rick. Thanks very much okay, again for your you. time. We we really appreciate it. Um, for everyone who's interested in future webinars that our Social Capital Research Group is holding, uh, in two weeks' time we have Dr. Evangelo Tontis, who's going to be talking about what lies beyond social capital, particularly. Uh, social identity theory and looking at it from a bit of a social psychology point of view. Uh, and on that same day, we also have uh, associate professor Paul Haynes, who's going to be talking uh, really about assembling social capital. And, and uh, he has the uh, the eight criticisms of social capital before moving forward with it. So I think, you know, it's quite a constructive kind of approach thinking well, about Send me some capital. links to these people so I can at least download their stuff, even if I don't have time to listen to them. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you an email, Rick. Um, Okay. So I think we can we can leave it there. Uh, thanks and very thank much, everyone, for, for coming. participating. Yeah. And I hope I hope it was helpful. Absolutely, it certainly was. Okay. Everyone's thumbs up and saying thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay.